Hey everyone, last month I made a video covering Ray Dalio's perspective on the markets in 2020. And in that video, I started by explaining three types of monetary policy that the Federal Reserve is using in order to stimulate the economy. We then went on to discuss the significant gap or divergence that is appearing between stock prices and the profits that those businesses are actually producing. And then right towards the end, I briefly started to explain Ray Dalio's solution to successfully investing in 2020. And that solution is to achieve wide diversification in your portfolio. But I didn't go any further than providing that brief explanation. And a lot of the feedback on that video was that you guys wanted an in-depth and practical guide in order to build one of these portfolios for yourself. How to invest in the way that Ray Dalio is suggesting for the average person in 2020 and beyond. So in today's video, I'm going to share with you Ray Dalio's favorite hands-off portfolio called the All Weather Portfolio. I'm going to show you exactly how you can build and manage this portfolio on an ongoing basis for yourself. I'm going to explain why this portfolio makes a lot of sense for the average person who has little to no experience investing in the markets. And finally, how this portfolio has performed over the last 12 years compared to investing purely in the stock market. As always, if you enjoy this video and you want to support the channel, then the best thing that you can do is just hit that like button as well as leave a comment down below sharing your feedback on today's video or any comments that you have or questions that you want to ask. I'll be answering questions as this video goes live. But for now, let's jump into it. So before I show you exactly how you can build the portfolio that Ray Dalio suggests the average person should be using when investing over the long term, I first want to explain what it is and how it works. So the main portfolio that Ray Dalio suggests that the average person should have is called the all weather portfolio. The all weather portfolio is actually relatively simple and it really has five major components. It is essentially a portfolio that is made up of 40% long-term bonds, 30% stocks, 15% intermediate term bonds, 7.5% gold and 7.5% commodities. And while looking at that, you might think that you now need to go out and buy some physical gold and then invest in a number of different stocks and then figure out what bonds to buy. That's actually not the case. And the easiest way and the most practical way that you can build this portfolio is just to invest in five different index funds that track each of these desired outcomes for us, whether it's intermediate bonds, long-term bonds, commodities, commodities, gold, or the stock market. And for those who don't know what an index fund is, it's relatively simple. Essentially, you are buying a single stock on the stock market. And that index fund is set up to track a group of stocks such as the biggest companies in the US. So for example, there is an index called the S&P 500, and that is a group of the 500 largest businesses in the US. And you can invest in an index fund from a company such as Vanguard or iShares that tracks the performance of that S&P 500 group of businesses. So now let's briefly jump over to my computer and I can quickly show you five examples of really large and safe index funds that you can use in order to build this portfolio really easily. All right. So before we take a look at some of the specific exchange traded funds that we can use in order to build this portfolio, let's quickly again, look at the overall portfolio. So we have 30% in stocks. We have 40% in long-term bonds. 15% in intermediate term bonds, so middle term bonds. Uh, we have gold at 7.5% and commodities at 7.5%. So that is what makes up the portfolio. How you go about structuring this in terms of how you buy your 30% stocks and which uh, fund you go with in order to build 30% uh, of your portfolio with stocks is not sort of set in stone. There's a number of different options that you can go with. So the five that I'm about to show you are just five examples of a way that you could build this portfolio. And I've selected ones that have some of the lowest fees. That's why I'm going after these particular exchange traded funds. But the first ETF is the Vanguard total market, total stock market ETF. And this would be how we would get our 30% stocks exposure 
uh, in this portfolio. Over on the right, you will see that the expense ratio is just 0.03%, which is very, very low. And it means that the fees associated with investing in this ETF are very, very low. They will have very little impact on your overall return. Under the product summary, we can see the aim of this ETF, which is to track the performance of the US total market index. So this is an index that represents a basket of businesses on the US stock market and it's supposed to represent all of the businesses on the US stock market. And that is what this investing in this ETF aims to achieve. We can then also have a look a little bit deeper. We can see that there is a total of 3,529 stocks that you get to invest in by investing in this single product. You can see the different industries that you get exposure to and then you can see the top 10 businesses that make up uh, as you can see here, 23.9% of the total assets. So about one quarter of uh, this fund is investing your money in Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, and the remaining ones on this list. The next ETF is again from Vanguard, and this one is BIV, Vanguard Intermediate Term Bond ETF. So this is, of course, our intermediate term bond part of the portfolio. Uh, and as you can see here again, the aim of this product is to track the investment return of the Bloomberg Barclays US 5 to 10 year government credit float adjusted index. So that's a very uh, long way of saying that they're taking a basket of medium term bonds, so five to 10 year bonds, mostly that are coming from the US government, but also from private businesses as well. Again, on the right, we can see the expense ratio and it's pretty low, 0.05%. And if we click over to the portfolio and management section, we can see that there is a total of 2,086 bonds within this ETF. And we can see over here that 49% of them are coming from the US government, which is basically considered risk-free. They've never defaulted on their bonds. And then there is a sizable chunk that are A-rated bonds and some are BAA-rated bonds. The next ETF, again, is from Vanguard. And this is the long-term bond ETF. And this, of course, makes up our long-term bond proportion of the portfolio. Uh, on the overview, we can see the expense ratio is, again, 0.05%. And we can head over to this section and see that uh, about 40% is in US government bonds. Uh, about 22% is in A and then 30% in BAA. And really the only difference between this one and the previous bond ETF is the maturity date of the bond. So as you can see, all of these bonds or at least 99% of the bonds uh, have a maturity that's over 10 years and most of them are 20 to 30 years. Whereas the one we were looking at previously were bonds that mature between five and 10 years out. Then we jump over to iShares, which is a brand or a company owned by BlackRock, which is another investment fund. And this is where we're going to get access to our commodity index. Again, you can see uh, what the investment objective is, which is to track the uh, GSCI commodity indexed trust. And again, you can see the management fees up at the top here, they call it sponsor fee. Now these ones are a little bit higher. You can see they're 0.75% compared to Vanguard's, which were about 0.05%. And then finally, we have iShares again for their gold trust, their management fee 0.25% and uh, the objective, which is to track the price performance of gold over time, as you would expect. One other thing to mention about this portfolio is what is the purpose of this portfolio, right? So when you're building your investment portfolio, you should have a certain aim, something you're aiming for, whether it's the highest growth or making sure that you don't lose any money on that portfolio. There's a number of different objectives depending on, on what you're trying to do. And this portfolio specifically aims to reduce the volatility of the portfolio while still offering a significant long-term return, a return that isn't too far below uh, what the US stock market could deliver over the long term. And when I say this portfolio is trying to reduce your volatility, really what we're trying to say is we're trying to reduce the amount that this portfolio goes down when there is a significant downward move in one of these asset classes. So for example, when the market goes down 40%, the stock market that is, what is this portfolio going to do? This portfolio is trying to not go down as far. And if you stick tight and hang around to the end, and I'm going to show you exactly the performance of this portfolio versus over the past 12 years versus or compared to if you had just invested 100% of your money 
in the US stock market. So now as promised, I'm going to show you exactly how you can go out and build this portfolio and then not just how you can build it, but then how you can manage it on an ongoing basis. What is required from you once you've invested in those index funds, once you've made those investments, what do you need to do? Is it just sit back and relax or is there something that you need to do on an ongoing basis? So the first thing that you need to do, of course, is invest in those five index funds. You need to invest in five index funds that represent the five pieces of the overall portfolio. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't need to invest in the ones that I specifically showed you today. They are just examples of uh, index funds that track those indices that we're looking for. Although you could find a, a different uh, investment fund that has the, the same product available, um, but they might just have different management fees, for example. So of course, to invest in these index funds, you will need a broker. And there are many different ones that you could choose from. Just to draw from my background in Australia, if you're Australian, there's a couple of ways that you can go. Uh, the index funds that I showed as an example in today's video, they are all on the US stock market. So if you want to invest in those ones specifically, then you will need an international trading account. You can either use something like Comsec International, NAB Trade International, or you could go for a brokerage free site like Stake. Um, but the other thing that you could do is you could just find the equivalent index fund that is on that's traded on the Australian Stock Exchange. So that's probably going to end up being cheaper in terms of brokerage and currency exchange rates. So trying to find the equivalent version on the ASX. And maybe in the future, I can do a video dedicated to looking at Australian index funds, but honestly, it's relatively easy to find. Just do a Google search for the indices that I spoke about in today's video and Google search for Australian versions of them. Vanguard has a number of Australian products that are available on the ASX. One really important thing to note when you're making these investments is try to keep your brokerage costs and exchange costs to below 1%. That's generally my sort of rule of thumb is try and keep those costs below 1%. If they're above 1%, I'll probably never do that investment. And usually you can do that just by investing a few thousand dollars at a time into each of those or looking for a free brokerage site, something like Stake, for example. But keeping those costs low will save you a ton over the long term. The next important thing to do once you've made those investments in those index funds is to track the performance over time. And this is important if you're buying uh, index funds in your own currency, so buying them on the ASX if you're Australian or on the US market if you're in America. Um, but it's even more important if you're Australian and you're buying US shares or US indices uh, because you have that exchange trade uh, exchange rate changes between the US and Australian dollar. And that's really hard to track manually. So you want to use something like ShareSite, which is a has a free plan available. You can use forever. And I think you can have up to 10 uh, stocks or 10 positions in your portfolio and still have a free account on ShareSite. So this portfolio could certainly be done with a free plan on ShareSite. Um, but they also have some paid plans where you get three months free or four months free, I think it is, when you sign up to a yearly subscription. So you can check out uh, all of those deals down in the description below. But using a service like that will allow you to easily keep track of your results and it will also help us to manage the portfolio over time. And what I'm talking about when I say manage this portfolio is what we call rebalancing. So this portfolio requires you to rebalance at least once per year. So that means essentially over time, over the course of a year, uh, the different parts of that portfolio will perform differently. And while at the start, you might have 30% in stocks, if the stock part of your portfolio does really well, that might grow to be 40% or 45% of the portfolio. So what you want to do once per year, and you can do this at the end of the year, is rebalance that portfolio to get the percentages back to what they were original, originally, where we had stocks at 30%, we had long-term bonds at uh, 40%, and then what do we have? Intermediate bonds at uh, 15%, and then commodities and gold at 7.5% each. And the same is true when you are adding more cash to this portfolio. So if you're saving up some money and you now want to add more to it, what you would want to do is head on to head over to ShareSide, have a look at what percentage each piece is making up. And when you're 
you're investing new cash, you want to be topping up the parts that are uh, under underweighted. So for example, let's say the stock part of the portfolio is now at 25% because stocks haven't really done that well. Well, when you're adding new cash to that portfolio, you want to top up the stocks so that it gets to that 30% pace. But once per year, you will need to, and you probably will definitely need to do this, uh, you will need to remove some or sell some out of the positions that are at a higher percentage than they should be and move that money into the positions where they're a lower percentage than they should be. So now I just want to talk about some of the reasons why this portfolio makes the most sense for people who are just getting started or people who have no interest in picking individual businesses and doing a ton of research. People who just want to build an investment portfolio but do not want to dive into the nitty gritty of researching companies and that sort of thing. The first benefit is that this portfolio has very, very low fees. So as long as you're keeping your brokerage to less than 1% as we spoke about earlier and you're investing in index funds that are similar or exactly the index funds that I showed you today, then the fees are very, very low. And as you saw, the management fees on index funds from Vanguard and from iShares from BlackRock, um, they're usually about 0.01% or 0.1% at the most. And that is very different to an actively managed portfolio, which will typically have something like a, a 2 or a 3% return. And often what an active management portfolio will have is if they outperform the market, they will then start taking significant fees, maybe five, 10 or 15% of any returns above the market's average. The second benefit for beginners is that you are widely diversified, not only in the stock market in terms of having a total stock market index, which gives you access to all of the stocks on the US stock market, but you're also diversified across different asset classes. And this has two key benefits. The first is that you have no unsystematic risk. So unsystematic risk is the risk associated with an individual, uh, individual investment, so an individual stock, for example, Example, you have none of that when you are this widely diversified. And the second be benefit is that you have much less volatility. And less volatility, as I mentioned earlier, just means that the portfolio bounces around uh, less than a typical straight stock market portfolio. And in theory, on paper, less volatility doesn't really mean anything, right? It really doesn't matter how much stocks bounce around. It kind of matters where they go over the very long term. But in practice, it does matter because people are emotional human beings, right? When stocks move around a significant amount, there is a high chance that you are going to make a bad decision like selling your stocks back in March after the market fell 30%. I know a lot of people who saw their stock portfolios go down significantly and they just sold out. They panicked and they thought, I can't take any more of this, even though in hindsight, that was probably the worst thing that you could have done. The best way for me to demonstrate the difference in volatility between the all weather portfolio and just investing strictly in the stock market is to have a look at over the past 12 years, the biggest drawdowns in both of those portfolios. So what were the biggest declines in the value of those portfolios. So if we take a look, we can see that in 2009, the all weather portfolio was down 19% at its worst. That was the worst drawdown over the past 12 years. And that compares to VTI, which is a total stock market index. That was down 48% at its worst point again in 2009. And basically across the past 12 years, almost every time that the total US stock market index went down, the all weather portfolio went down less. So it's going to be less volatile. It's going to be moving down less when there's a significant drawdown, but at the same time, it's going to be moving up less in most cases uh, when the total stock market portfolio is going up. And then of course, the other important factor to think about is not just how much does the portfolio bounce around, what is the volatility, but what is the long-term return of this portfolio compared to investing strictly in the US stock market? So again, using this website, we can compare investing $10,000 into the all weather portfolio versus investing in VTI, which is the US total stock market index at the start of 2008. This portfolio also involves rebalancing at the end of each year as we discussed earlier in today's video. And what you can see is that the all weather portfolio generated a 7.1% compounded return over that period compared to the total US stock market's return of 8.9% compounded over that period. So the all weather portfolio is less volatile than investing strictly in the US stock market, but the US stock market generated a 2% higher per year compounded return than 
investing in the all weather portfolio. And in dollar terms, in that $10,000 investment, the difference after 12 years is a $24,000 portfolio versus a $29,000 portfolio. So there is a significant difference, but that is the trade off that you're making when investing in this portfolio is, do I want to have the highest returns possible, but risk the chance that I could make a bad decision if my portfolio is down significantly or take the safer route where I have a less volatile portfolio, I'm less likely to make an emotional incorrect decision, and I'm still making a very good return over the long term. So the bottom line here, if you're thinking about whether I should invest in an all weather portfolio versus investing strictly in the US stock market or a global stock market index, for example, the question you need to ask yourself is, can you stomach a 50% drop or seeing your portfolio be flat or negative for an eight or a 12 year period, for example, because that's what the stock market does. The stock market bounces around a lot. And there are periods where returns are terrible. But what you need to do if you're investing strictly in that US stock market index is to hold that entire time and actually consistently contribute more over that time. If you can't do that, then in practice, it's likely that the all weather portfolio will actually deliver you in practice better returns because you're less likely to make a bad decision. But then on the flip side, if you can avoid making bad emotional decisions when a stock portfolio is down 30% or it has been negative for eight years, if you can avoid making bad decisions, then ultimately the US stock market, strictly investing in the US stock market, delivered a better return over the long term. So that's the trade-off you have to make in practice, in the data, in statistics, in lo looking at historical data, we've seen that investors who try and not make emotional decisions on average make emotional decisions and do the wrong thing, which is why an all weather portfolio makes a lot of sense for most people. But the pure theoretical outcome for both portfolios is that the stock market will do better for you if you can stay out of being emotional in the market. So now I wanna hear your thoughts on this. What do you think about this? Do you think it makes sense for people to invest in something like an all weather portfolio or should people just try and not be emotional and hope that they can restrain themselves from selling when their, their portfolio portfolio is down 50%. Let me know what your thoughts are on this entire video and or anything in between or any questions that you have or any comments you want to share. Let me know down in the comment section below. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And as I said at the start, it took me a, a lot of effort to put this video together. So I'd very much appreciate it if you could leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. And of course, hit subscribe if you want to see more content like this. But for now, I hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.